he has worked in civil and geotechnical engineering projects both in uk and abroad so demos once again thank you for uh, joining the webinar and uh, handing over the platform to you Thank you. Thank you, Shurab. Uh, I would like to take this opportunity and thank the Tanning Association of uh, India Young Members for inviting me uh, to give this talk. Um, so today's presentation. Um, this presentation uh, will be um, a general talk on the challenges uh, in drill and blast uh, tunneling in Hong Kong. Oh, and I, I will focus on um, a project that uh, COVID has designed and since then uh, has been built uh, in Hong Kong. A brief uh, outline of the presentation. Uh, I will give a, a small introduction um, just to make sure that everybody knows a few things about Hong Kong. Uh, then I will uh, discuss, uh, give some background information about uh, the project uh, that we designed. Uh, I will discuss a bit in more detail about the design aspects, design elements of uh, a drill and blast tunnel. That will be followed by some lessons learned. Um, then I will discuss about uh, a couple of uh, value engineering exercises we undertook on this project. And I will close this uh, presentation giving some uh, photos uh, from during construction. Um, just uh, to give a bit background information about Hong Kong. Um, so Hong Kong is on the southeast um, part of China, which you can just about see here in this small dot. Uh, and then this is a zoom in which uh, highlights this the, the area where Hong Kong is. Um, it uh, shares uh, land borders with China and that's that's the Hong Kong mainland. And this here is uh, referred to as the Hong Kong Island. Um, uh, Hong Kong has been uh, in the past uh, um, a Commonwealth uh, country and then in 1998 it was handed back uh, to China and since then it operates as a special administrative region. Since then China um, want, wanted to invest uh, heavily um, in Hong Kong and cre create the infrastructure so that Hong Kong becomes a, a, a gate uh, to the west. Um, here I have also added uh, some some photos from Google Maps where you can see how mountainous the terrain is in Hong Kong uh, here in this area and how difficult uh, it is then to build all these inf big infrastructure projects. Um, this slide uh, with this slide I would like to uh, make a comparison between uh, Hong Kong and uh, London which uh, have uh, approximately similar population. Um, in terms of uh, an area that uh, Hong Kong occupies, uh, this is approximately two thirds of that of London. However, the developed area in Hong Kong uh, is only about a quarter of that on London. And the main reason for that is uh, due to the mountainous terrain that I referred to in my previous slide. And due to that reason, uh, the density uh, in Hong Kong is about five times more compared to that of London. On the left hand side, you can see a photo from Hong Kong with uh, all these um, high rise buildings uh, and how that compares with uh, on the right, right hand side with the photo from London. And another interesting uh, statistic for Hong Kong is that more people live in these buildings above the 14th floor uh, than any other place in the world. Um, some background information then uh, about the project that I will discuss today. Um, so here in uh, this photo you can see uh, um, a part of Hong Kong. Uh, here in the north is the border with China. Uh, the red line in the, is a um, um, the 26 meter long um, express railing. Uh, this is the new line that was proposed uh, a few years ago. 
that's 26 kilometers in length. Uh, it's within the Hong Kong area, and that was split in nine contracts. Our contract uh, lies between the two villages of Nao Tamei in the north and Tai Kompo in the south. In between these two villages, there is um, a hill about 300, 350 meters uh, high. Um, the contractor uh, for this contract was a joint venture between uh, Kier, uh, Kaden and Osa. And Kovi has been appointed as a contractor's designer. Uh, for this 2.6 kilometers length of the contract, and we were responsible for the design of the permanent and temporary support of the tunnels, but also the design of the temporary support of the shafts. Here at the bottom, you can see a long section along this 26 uh, kilometer uh, length of this uh, proposed new uh, rail line. And our contract, the 2.6 kilometers that I will discuss today, is uh, in this area. And you can see this uh, uh, mountainous hill that uh, we were asked to design uh, below. Now, this this project uh, is part of a wider project of the Chinese uh, government that the, uh, they want to invest in the infrastructure and improve the infrastructure. Um, and therefore, uh, they decided to build a new express railway uh, link connecting uh, um, Guangzhou, which is a city in the China, in the north, with uh, West Kowloon uh, in Hong Kong area. Uh, and the aim for that was to reduce traveling time be between these two cities from uh, currently 100 minutes down to 50 minutes approximately, and also increase the capacity of, of uh, um, passengers. The current line uh, that takes about 100 minutes to travel uh, between the two cities, you can see here uh, with the black line and the, the, the new the express rail link, uh, you can see here with red line within the, the China. Uh, and then with the blue line is within the Hong Kong area. Uh, this slide here shows schematically uh, the geology and the topography uh, for our contract. Uh, as I said previously, we had to tunnel 2.6 kilometers in length under this hill, which was a maximum of uh, 350 meters uh, cover. Uh, in the north, uh, we had to design and construct uh, this 90 meter deep shaft, uh, which is called Nao Tamei. And in the south, there was a 40 meter deep shaft, uh, which was called Tai Kung Po. Uh, the drift geology consisted of uh, alluvium and the completely decomposed, decomposed uh, tuff, which you can see with these uh, light colors here. And then with this green color uh, here, you can see the solid uh, geology, with, which uh, consist consisted of um, strong to, to extremely strong uh, tuff. Because of uh, the geology, how how uh, good the rock was and the topography, the 350 meters of overburden, uh, it was decided that the most appropriate method of uh, construction was drill and blast, and that uh, a TBM uh, was not appropriate in the in these uh, ground conditions. This photo now shows uh, the site in the south and the Tai Kompo shaft, the 40 meter deep shaft, looking north. And this is the 350 meter hill that we had to tunnel through. Uh, so that's looking north. Uh, uh, the other thing to note here is uh, um, that there aren't any roads here, so there's no easy access to get drilling rigs in order to drill boreholes uh, and extract ground information for this uh, area. And for that reason, uh, the ground uh, information we had, the borehole logs were very limited. In this slide, I will try to explain uh, very briefly uh, a cycle, a typical cycle of uh, the drill and blast uh, advance. So for this project and for these ground conditions, we typically uh, had uh, between five to six meters of advance lengths for each cycle with the aim of advancing approximately 40 meters within a week. So the first part of the cycle consists of drilling uh, some holes in the face of the tunnel. Uh, 
so that in the next uh, phase uh, you put some explosives and detonators and uh, you charge these explosives. Uh, the next part of the cycle uh, uh, is the actual blasting, so I will show a, a very short video um, about that. This is a video from another contract, not from our contract, and it shows a blasting of a bench. What that is, so typically um, when you excavate the tunnel, it, it, it's full face excavation and, and you blast uh, the face, but in, in some cases you may have uh, the face split into two, the top heading and the bench. So what you will see in this video is the blasting of the bench. And before the blasting, you need to make sure that all people uh, working underground either evacuate the area or move to a position of safety. So hopefully this video will play. Yep, so hopefully you all saw that. Uh, so in initially you saw the detonation and then uh, the blasting. Uh, the next uh, part of the cycle is to um, the ventilation. So you need to bring um, fresh air in the face and remove all the uh, particles that might uh, cause any health, health problems to the people underground. So you need to bring good quality air in the face. Uh, this then is followed by marking, so you need to remove all the, the blasted material, the blasted rock, uh, and that can take, it's, it's a big task and can take anything between, you know, six to ten hours to, to remove all this uh, rubble. The next uh, part of the cycle is to do the scaling, so you need to make sure that you remove any uh, loose blocks that may fall uh, prior to installing the support and and therefore for health and safety reasons, uh, you need to do that. Uh, and as you notice from this photo, this is done from distance so that uh, you are not supposed to, to do this uh, in an area where the support has not been placed, has not been installed. Once scaling is finished, then uh, people can move closer to the face, but uh, always below an area where it has been supported so that they can do the face mapping and the survey and decide what support needs to be installed in the blasted area. And the last step of the cycle is to install the support, which typically for a drill and blast tunnel, this consists of um, rock bolts and, and sprayed concrete. And that's the last part of the cycle, and then the next cycle, uh, the next advanced uh, uh, starts. Uh, for this uh, project, uh, uh, the client uh, uh, indicated that uh, they would want to have a, a permanent lining as well. Uh, for this to happen, obviously, you need the, the temporary lining to be installed first to provide a safe environment for the workers um, to work underground and install the permanent lining. So uh, this typically for a drill and blast tunnels. Now what that consists of this support is uh, the primary or temporary support, which, uh, as I mentioned previously, it's uh, sprayed concrete with um, uh, rock bolts, which is you can see here in this area, the, the sprayed concrete. Um, then this is followed by typically with a waterproof membrane in this project. In other projects, maybe a sprayed membrane, um, assuming that there is water underground. If there's no water, it's completely dry. Obviously, you don't need to install that. And then you can see the the permanent the permanent lining installed uh, in the end. And on the right hand side is a detail from one of our drawings detailing the three different elements that I just uh, described. Uh, in this slide, um, I'm showing in plan view the 2.6 kilometers of our contract that we had to design. Uh, this is um, uh, the shaft in the north and this is uh, the shaft in the south. I have cut this in, in three elements because it wasn't easy to put the whole, uh, the whole uh, line in one, in one go. Um, 
so what we had to design was two, as I said, mentioned previously, two shafts. Uh, the now Tamei shaft in the north, which is uh, 90 meters deep. Uh, the Tai Kompo shaft, which is 40 meters deep, and that is in the south. So these two shafts uh, demark the, the, the extent of our contract. We also had to design uh, a crossover cavern, uh, which initially during tendering process, uh, this was located in this area. And during that time, we undertook a big uh, value engineering exercise to demonstrate the benefits of moving the cavern closer to the shaft. I will discuss about this later on in this presentation. Uh, another item we had to design was the uh, twin bifurcations, and what I mean by that is you can see that uh, you have four consecutive enlargements of the tunnel profile. So at the end, at the largest uh, span, that can host a second uh, stub tunnel to accommodate a future uh, extension of, of, of the line. Uh, uh, the main element, design element we had to do was the single track running tunnels, which run for 2.6 kilometers. Uh, but because these were twin tunnels, uh, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, it was almost just over five kilometers uh, length of tunnels. We then also had to design the so-called plenum tunnels, which were the tallest and largest tunnels, uh, and these were used for ventilation purposes uh, to bring air from the shaft into the this cavern and the other way. I will discuss about this in more detail later on in the presentation. Uh, we had to design cross passages every 250 meters, which you can see here uh, schematically. And the last design uh, element was a sump pit to collect the, the water uh, underground during construction, which was here in this area. Um, in this slide, you can see the different profiles uh, we had to design. Uh, which, as you can see, there quite a lot. And then if on top of that, uh, uh, you, you see that for each of these profiles, you had to de design different support types to accommodate different ground conditions. That will become clearer in the following slides. You can see how, how big the task was to design for these tunnels. These four profiles are for the bifurcations, which, as I mentioned previously, are the four different enlargements in profile so that then at the end, at the largest part, they can accommodate uh, two tunnels, two single track profile tunnels. This is the big cavern that uh, we did the value engineering exercise and we had to move then uh, closer to the, the shaft in the north. These are the plenum tunnels, the tallest tunnels that we had to design. Uh, their main purpose was for ventilation. These are three different profiles of the single track uh, running tunnels. Uh, this was the typical profile, and then these two are uh, some small enlargements. And finally, these are three different uh, profiles for the cross passages. So in the following uh, few slides, I would uh, show you some photos uh, of each of these elements uh, so you can understand the size uh, of these excavations. So the first photo here shows uh, the 90 meter deep shaft in the north, the, the now Tamei shaft. On the right hand side, you can see a 3D schematic of this shaft. This had a very strange uh, shape uh, and we were responsible for the design of the primary temporary support. We weren't responsible for the permanent lining, uh, so we, we had the constraint that we had to follow this profile, this shape. You can see at the top, uh, it's uh, a circular cylindrical uh, shape, and uh, halfway through there is a bell out that then uh, changes the profile to a rectangular. Um, the circular part is about 40, 45 meters, and then uh, the transition plus the rectangular box, another 45, 50 meters uh, depth. So overall, it's 90 meters uh, uh, depth. On the right hand side here, this small dot is in scale a two meter uh, high uh, person, just to show you um, in scale um, 
how big this this um, shaft was. What you can see here in this photo uh, in the middle is a, a photo from the ground surface looking down the way the excavation and you can see that up to this point uh, the shaft uh, is being supported by these piles and we weren't responsible for this support. Our uh, responsibility lies uh, below these. These piles were used to support the, the overburden material, so the soil. So that's the transition here, the end of the piles, the transition from soil into rock. And as you can see in this photo there, uh, the support of the shaft in rock then uh, consisted of sprayed concrete and, and, and rock bolts. Uh, uh, and here, uh, at this point is where the circular part of the shaft finishes and then the, the bell out starts. And in this photo is at the bottom of the shaft, 19 meters deep, looking up the way. And you can see this part here that's supported by the piles, which was not our responsibility. Our responsibility started from this collar. Uh, so you can see the circular part, the cylindrical part of the shaft and then the transition, and then uh, the bottom part, which is rectangular in shape. This is the other shaft in the south, the, the 40 meter deep shaft, um, and you can see a similar arrangement. You can see some piles here to support the overburden uh, in soil, and when the transition uh, between soil and rock is, that's where the piles terminate, and that's where our COVID responsibility starts. So we were responsible to provide the support of the shaft in the rock here. Now, uh, I've said that this is a smaller shaft, only 40 meters deep compared to the other shaft in the north, but still you can see that this is like a, a, a large excavation, uh, approximately 14 meters by 28. In this photo, you can see um, the single track uh, running tunnel uh, profile, which, as I mentioned previously, uh, it runs uh, for about five kilometers in length, 2.6 in its in its direction. Um, this was one of the smallest profiles we had to design, uh, almost circular in shape uh, for a better redistribution of the stresses. You can see the support, which again consists of uh, the sprayed concrete. And as I said, even though this is one of the smallest profiles we had to design, uh, you can see that it, it's a fairly big excavation if you compare it against the people uh, mapping the face here. Um, in this photo, you can see uh, the bifurcation. It's the largest of the four profiles. So schematically, uh, as I mentioned previously, the bifurcation hosts four different uh, consecutive enlargements. So what you can see in this photo is, is the last enlargement here uh, where uh, it, it needs to host two different tunnels. So this is the single track running tunnel. And, and here uh, it will be built the, the short stub tunnel to accommodate a future extension of the line. This photo shows uh, the cavern, uh, the big cavern, which is close to the uh, shaft in the north. Uh, this is a 3D schematic uh, up here. Um, so this is the, the deep shaft, the 90 meter deep shaft, uh, and this is the cavern. And the two, these are the two largest excavations in, in our contract, and these are the tall uh, plenum tunnels uh, for ventilation purposes that connect the two. The length of this cavern is about 115 meters, and at the time of construction, this was one of the largest caverns uh, in the Hong Kong network. Uh, here in, in this sketch, um, you can see how the cavern profile, which is this, along with the two single track running tunnels, uh, compare against some typical uh, tunnel profiles in, in, in London. So on the left hand side, this is the, the crossrail profile is the, the Elizabeth, the new Elizabeth line. Uh, it, it's not exactly to scale, but it gives you an indication on the magnitude. And this is the, the old London underground uh, tunnels. Uh, um, it just again, it just to show the, the, the difference in the magnitude of the excavation. Um, so this slide shows uh, 
how these uh, excavations compare against the, uh, you know, for instance, the Big Ben uh, is, is about 90 meters deep, the same the same depth as as the the shaft in the north, and the length of the cavern compares with a, a football pitch. So again, that's another uh, indication of, of the magnitude and size of these excavations that we had to design. In this uh, photo, you see the plenum tunnels, which, as I said, connect uh, the shaft in the north with the cavern. You can see schematically here in plan view, so it's these tunnels connecting the shaft with the cavern. These were the, the, the larger tunnels we had to design in this area, so you can see uh, the height was about just under 14 meters and a span of just under uh, 11. And, and, and the biggest difficulty we had uh, during the design was to make sure that this slender pillar, which is very thin and tall, is not overstressed, which that could pose a health and safety issue during construction. And again, just to get a feeling of the size of these tunnels, these uh, excavations, you can compare it against the size of that person uh, sitting just uh, below this uh, opening. I will discuss about that problem in more detail later on, uh, but uh, that was one of the big drives of the value engineering exercise of having to move the cover, this um, cavern closer to the shaft to reduce the length of these uh, large tunnels and therefore reduce the risk of this uh, overstressing, this pillar being overstressed. And the last design item, uh, it's the cross passages. So here you can see the two uh, uh, single track running tunnels running in parallel and, and, and the, the uh, uh, cross passage here. Uh, as I mentioned uh, in one of the previous slides, uh, we had to design uh, these every 250 meters um, in our contract. Uh, uh, and the main purpose was to assist during construction, but also in, in case of any emergency. On the right hand side, you can see a typical drawing, a typical detail of these cross passages in plan view and, and a cross section. Um, so moving on now to the, the design elements, uh, the design parts of, of a drilling blast tunnel. Um, so I will briefly discuss the process uh, of, of the design. So initially we need to gather all the available uh, GI information in with regards to boreholes, lab tests, in-situ tests, um, and uh, make an assessment of the ground conditions, create our own geological model, uh, derive our own uh, design parameters. So from then, the borehole logs we can also get information about uh, the joint sets, uh, the discontinuities uh, in the rock mass, uh, and we then do a statistical assessment of the joints so that we come up with the most dominant joint sets and we do then the design based on these dominant joint sets which typically can be like three to four or five. In this case we used a, a software called DIPS to do this. We then use a, an empirical uh, rock mass quality uh, method uh, which is uh, the Q method. Uh, to derive, uh, to come up with a, an initial support for these tunnels. Uh, this would then be followed by um, an assessment of the potential of uh, failure of discrete blocks. We, for this purpose, would use the, the um, unwed software and see whether the support we derived from the Q method is adequate to support the potential wedges around the profile of the tunnel. We would then undertake numerical analysis to verify the support that we initially derived from the Q method or refine that. And uh, we would also do then the, the standard time uh, assessment uh, using this empirical method by Bieniawski. We would have to do all these uh, items for each of the design elements in our contract. One of the biggest tasks we had to do was to do this numerical uh, modeling for these elements. And an, an initial question the designer has to ask is if, if uh, the project is in rock, if the ground conditions are in rock, 
whether they need to undertake a continuum or discontinuum approach. Uh, so uh, what this slide is trying to demonstrate is that uh, it, it's it's not a simple uh, uh, thinking for that. One needs to consider uh, the, the network of discontinuities relative to the size of the opening. But in most in most cases, uh, if your project is in rock, then uh, you would have to undertake a discontinuum approach. On the right hand side here, uh, what uh, I have is uh, an output from UDEC of the same tunnel excavation. And the top, this is modeled as a discontinuum. So in this block here, I, I have uh, generated a, a network of, of joints. Whereas in the bottom, uh, I've done the same analysis, but uh, this time this is modeled as a continuum without joints. For ease of uh, reference, uh, the scale uh, in the contours are, are the same. And what you can see here at the bottom at the continuum approach is that you can see how the major principal stresses nicely uh, uh, arch around the excavation. So that's the arching effect. Whereas here in the discontinuum approach, you, you don't see the same distribution of the stresses because you have the joints and therefore the stresses try to follow uh, the orientation of, of, of the joints. Uh, so you can understand by looking, compare these two, uh, that there will be different support requirements uh, compared to the stress distribution and whether you adopt the continuum versus the discontinuum approach. In this slide, uh, there is a similar comparison, but this time uh, you can see the displacement vectors. On the left hand side, it's it's the discontinuum and here you, you can also see the network of, of uh, the joints that have been generated for this output. And on the right hand side, um, it's the continuum approach without any joints, so you don't see any joints here. And uh, the scale this time is not the same, but what you can clearly see is that the roof is moving by the same amount uh, 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 around the roof of the tunnel in the continuum approach, wherein it, whereas in the discontinuum approach, uh, the maximum uh, displacement occurred in the areas where you have some loose blocks or the orientation of the joints is such that the blocks want to slide into the excavation. So you can see uh, in this case, in the way the, the joints were generated, that happens here. In either side of that area, it's significantly less. Whereas in the continuum approach, you can see how uniform uh, the displacement is around the roof. And again, depending on which approach one decides to choose, then uh, it will come up with different support requirements. So how we did that, how did we end up creating a, a joint uh, pattern in, in the software we used, which was UDEC, and make sure that what we generate is realistic? So uh, initially what we did was to uh, interrogate the 3D Televiewer data, which is that. So here you can see a 3D uh, of, of the borehole, and these planes, um, indicate the orientation of, of the joints. So we get this uh, data from the Televiewer uh, data and we import that into DIPS to come up with the most dominant joint sets as, as I described previously. The next uh, important step is then to uh, do a block size assessment as it's called. So you want to create uh, sizes of blocks that are representative of what happens on site. Uh, one thing uh, to be aware of is that because this is a 2D analysis, you, one needs to work out the apparent dip for these uh, joints and not just input the the dip uh, uh, and dip orientation directly from from uh, the televiewer data. And uh, the way to see that is that if you take a slice of of this along this plane that would indicate that the sliding plane is, is in this direction. Whereas if you take a section along this side, the sli sliding plane would be along this direction. And then the reality is if that's the joint network that 
the 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 blocks will slide differently in different directions. So you need to make an assessment how best to to model uh, the wedges in in a two D analysis. So after creating the network of joints in UDEC, we would then extract this information and we would do a normal distribution uh, analysis. So that would indicate what's the um, uh, the sizes of the blocks that we have just generated. We would then find the 50% of these blocks. Where would that lie? So the 50% of would give you here on the horizontal axis a, a typical uh, size of block of you know X, and we would then have to compare that against the size of the blocks that we would derive from the block size assessment from a particular borehole. And that's shown here indicatively by this, this uh, hatched uh, area. So if the two would be close enough, it would mean that our calibration is, is sufficient and then we would have high confidence that what we're trying to model there is, is you know, accurately represents reality. A few words about uh, uh, the Q system. Um, so this was first introduced in, in 1974 by Barton. This is a, a rock mass quality assessment, and it's a mean of defining a support for, for a tunnel and an underground excavation. Um, so what you see here on the bottom, is uh, the rock mass quality index, which is given by this equation. I won't go into the details explaining what that is. You can find more information uh, on the web if you download this uh, handbook from uh, the Norwegian Geotechnical Institute. It's freely available uh, online. Uh, and, and just to say that when the Q is higher, uh, so as you move to the right hand side, it means that the rock is uh, better. When the Q values are lower, it means that uh, the rock is, is, is worse. On the left hand side, it's the span uh, of your uh, um, uh, excavation, like the tunnel. Uh, here in the top, you see some numbers there that would indicate um, the spacing of the bolts. On the right hand side, uh, vertical axis, uh, you can see the requirements for the bolt length, the minimum requirements, depending on the span. And finally, here you can see some numbers, uh, you know, two, three, four, five, and that indicate areas, which uh, would give you an approximation of what the lining thickness should be, the spread concrete lining thickness. So we use that system to, to come up with an initial support for our tunnels, and I just give an example here. We came up with different support classes, uh, and each of these support classes would be would uh, be uh, would have different uh, ranges of that Q value. And here you can see what are the support requirements for the class 2B, which is a Q of ranging between one and two and a half, and then class 3A. So two uh, uh, adjoining uh, support classes, and you can see how much different the support requ requirements are. And then you can imagine how much even more different would be the support requirements if you compare class 1A to 4. Uh, this slide shows uh, how the Q chart was initially when it was first published in 74, and then later on the three major uh, up updates. And this is what is currently being used. Uh, moving on to the lessons learned. Uh, so, very briefly to say that uh, as every method, uh, you know, it's this uh, chart also has its limitations. So, on either side, on the two extremities of this chart, what I would say is that there's no guidance after this area when the Q value is, is more than 10. Um, what the bolt spacing should be. Now, typically you don't get bolt spacing uh, wider than two and a half meters because then you don't have the, 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 the composite effect. It's as if it, it's a spot bolt. So maybe that's the reason why, but there's no guidance as to like what to do in this area. And then similarly on the other side of uh, the chart where the rock is very exceptionally poor as described, uh, uh, there's no guidance as to what to do, um, what's the, the bolt spacing. Uh, 
in this area. Again, typically you don't put bolts closely, closer space than one meter, uh, but I, there's no guidance. Uh, previously, I also mentioned that there are these areas, uh, you know, four, five, six, seven, eight, that you can come up with uh, the lining thickness. So if uh, the requirements are within zone five, for instance, you know that the lining thickness should be between 90 millimeters to 120. If uh, the support requirements are within zone eight, there is no guidance as to what the support requirements is other than the bottom line in, in that zone uh, indicates a lining thickness of 250, but uh, there's no indication about the, the upper uh, requirements, so it's down to the designer. So I think that's a limitation that we shouldn't be using that chart if we need to support something that falls in, in this category. Uh, what we found when using this was that um, because this is an empirical chart, uh, it's based on case studies from the past and most of the case studies were falling within this area and that's where it's, it's more useful. So just something to bear in mind that if you have to design something and, and you need to design it, it, it's, it falls in that area, then you have high confidence. If it's out with that area, then you need to perhaps do some other assessment um, and not just use this uh, chart. Uh, something very interesting, uh, so with regard to the support pressure, uh, so in the initial publication, the 74, um, this formula was introduced uh, so that somebody can come up with an estimation of the support, uh, the pressure, the support pressure in the roof. There was a note to say that this formula, uh, the units for this formula was in kilograms per centimeter square and not what we typically would use in KPA or MPA. Now, in a later publication, 2002, uh, Barton then uh, uh, mentioned that if you want to have the roof pressure in megapascals, then you need to use that formula. So it's a conversion of the initial formula. However, later on in uh, Nick Barton's web page, there is a file which is not published in a, in a journal or a proceedings publication that mentions that this formula, which was published in the 2002 publication, has an error. And instead, if you want the pressure in MPA, you should be using this. So just something to, to be worried about. Another thing we found was uh, if you're using uh, the Q uh, method to derive the rock mass stiffness, uh, there are various formulas available. Uh, and I will just show an example to see um, the difference between the different methods, the available methods. So firstly, if you were to use the Serafim and Pereira uh, equation of the rock mass, uh, this is based on the RMR which is another classification system, but then you have this formula to convert the Q into RMR. So for a given Q values, if you convert that to RMR and then use the Seraphim formula for the rock mass, you end up with these um, rock mass stiffnesses. If, however, you were to use this Barton formula where uh, it correlates Q with rock mass directly without the use of RMR, and for the same Q values, you can see like for like how they compare. Now, one thing to note is that for the higher Q values, even though there is a 5, 6 uh, gigapascal difference for such a high stiffness value, that doesn't affect the design as much. In all likelihood, um, the tunnel could stay unsupported. But for lower Q values, you can see the magnitude of the rock mass stiffness is almost half, depending on, on which method you use. So, what I would say is that when you're using uh, these formulas to come up with stiffnesses, rock mass stiffness, it's always good to have also um, lab tests uh, or other ground investigation information or published data from the same uh, area that you want to design so that uh, you have a better understanding whether it's closer you know, to, to these values or that value. 
and the last of the lessons learned items is the, the stand up time. So we use this this uh, chart from Bieniawski uh, on the left hand side. Uh, what you see is the, the roof span, which uh, there is some ambiguity as to what that is, whether that refers to the span of the tunnel in cross section or if that uh, refers to the advanced length in the longitudinal distance. But I'll come back to that. Uh, on the horizontal axis, it's the stand-up times, and then here this envelope uh, plots the RMR values. Uh, so it's the, the alternative classification system to the Q. Uh, and just to give an example of that, if, if you have a certain RMR uh, value, say 45, then you plot this in that region parallel to, to the black lines. And then if you want to design a span of 10 meters, say, for this RMR, then that plots here in this area where you say that you are in the area of immediate collapse and that then the tunnel can be unsupported up to one day. So obviously this is not acceptable, so you want to, to, to reduce the roof span. So if you were then to reduce it down to two and a half meters, you would be in this area and you would see that in this area, it's in the area where almost no support required and the unsupported, uh, the stand-up time can be more than one week. Uh, so th that's how that works. Now, as I said, there is some ambiguity as to what that is, but uh, the intention is that this roof span is all, always refers to the, the advanced length. So it's the longitudinal distance, not, not the, the, the span of the tunnel. Moving on to the value engineering. Um, so we did two major value engineering exercises in this project. Uh, one was the reprofiling of the tunnel, which you can see here at the top. So initially when we received the tender drawings, we the tunnel, the shape of the tunnel was indicated by this white uh, you know, tunnel profile here, which what you can see is that that was taller uh, and with a smaller uh, span compared to the reprofiling we did uh, and that reduced the height of the tunnel but made the span a bit larger. But what we achieved in this way, we achieved a more circular profile compared to the tender drawings which were showing more straight walls. And because of that circular profile, that assisted in the stress redistribution and less load transfer onto the tunnel and therefore the requirements for the lining thickness reduced significantly. And as I say here, we managed to have up to 80% reduction in the reinforcement of the permanent lining because of that. The other, uh, as part of that reprofiling, we also managed to come up with radii for the tunnels and for the shutters that could be used in multiple tunnels uh, for this project. So you, you don't have to have different uh, shutter profiles uh, for different um, tunnels, uh, 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 but the main value engineering exercise was moving the cavern uh, from its initial location during tender uh, to this location. So uh, the contract was awarded to Covey uh, based on the initial compliant design, as it was called, uh, when the cavern was here, but with the intention that Covey would work on the alternative design moving the cavern closer to the shaft, and I will describe that in more detail, the benefits of moving the cavern here. Um, so the, the reasons we decided to move the cavern was, first of all, that by moving the cavern from this location, which was 200 meters away from the shaft to this location, which was only 20 meters away, we managed to reduce the length of the plenum tunnels, which are these tunnels, the, the, the tallest tunnels we had to design. And by the same time, we had to increase then the length of these tunnels behind the cavern, which were the single track tunnels. So straight away, you can see we had significant gains in the excavated volume. A, a byproduct of that, because you had to excavate a smaller volume, it means you had a faster construction. So this, this uh, uh, tunnel was excavated in full phase, whereas the requirement for that was uh, in, in top heading and bench. Uh, on top of that, then there were less support requirements. So you can see with the, the gray hats, the requirements for the permanent lining. So you can see how much thinner uh, the, the, that is in the single track compared to the plenum. 
uh, and most importantly, uh, we reduce the risk of having this overstressed pillar between the plenum tunnels here. Uh, if you remember, I showed you a photo showing how thin the pillar was between the, the tall tunnels. Uh, so overall, we provided a buildable, innovative and safe design by uh, moving the cavern uh, to this location and uh, everybody was satisfied with the outcome of this exercise. Here in this table, you can briefly see the, the savings in the excavated material in the volumes. Uh, some, some photos moving on towards the end of the presentation uh, of, of the construction. So we had to come up with a fairly complicated construction sequence for the cavern. It was quite important for the contractor to, to excavate this quite soon. So then they would have they would be able to have two teams tunneling from either end of the contract uh, tunneling in both directions. So it was quite important to tunnel through this cavern uh, quite quite early in the, in, in the program. So what that shows is after finishing the excavation of, of the 90 meter deep shaft, you then excavate the, one of the two plenum tunnels, you ramp up and you enter into the cavern uh, at the top heading and you start excavating a small pilot over the full length. So you identify the ground conditions in this area. Once you do that, then you start excavating the side drift. So subsequently in the next stages, you can see slide, uh, the, 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 the excavation of the side drifts. So you end up at stage five where you have fully excavated and supported the top heading. And then the next three stages uh, of the sequence show just the excavation of, of the bench. Once the bench uh, was excavated, then it was easy for the second team that was tunneling from the north uh, to be able to, to uh, progress, advance the excavation as well. A, a few photos show, showing the different construction stages uh, for the crossover cavern. So here you can see where uh, the full cavern has been excavated and here you can see the temporary supports of the sprayed concrete being applied. Then you can see the waterproofing membrane. In the next stage, you can see uh, the permanent support at the wall and the invert. And then finally, uh, you know, casting uh, the permanent support uh, in the roof. Uh, and in this photo, you can see the internal details, the internal walls and, and this, the slab and, and the roof, which is um, you can see in this cross section how this looks like. A similar uh, slide showing the uh, construction sequence uh, for the single track running tunnel. So here you can see the sprayed concrete being applied, the waterproofing membrane, uh, some reinforcement that was required in, 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 ju in junctions or in area of, of uh, poorer ground conditions, and then the final permanent lining. And, and you can see how good job uh, was done. A uh, couple of slides here on the design what was shown in the drawings, the modeling uh, and final construction, uh, how it was built uh, and that that's for the cavern here at the top. In the bottom you can see the same for the single track running tunnel. Uh, at the top of this slide uh, you can see the sequence for the bifurcation and at the bottom you can see again the sequence, the, the drawings, uh, the analysis and construction, how it was built uh, of the plenum tunnels. Uh, one slide very briefly to uh, show you the shutter, how it looks. Uh, and as, as I mentioned previously, we designed uh, the radii of the tunnels to be such that part of the shutter can be used at different design elements. Uh, this slide shows some uh, difficulties, let's say, during during construction, the, how the, the conditions were. Uh, people here are trying to um, install the explosives for the next round of blasting within one of the two shafts, and you can see, you know, the, the, the whole area is, is submerged with water. This this slide is is quite important um, uh, for construction mainly and things that can go wrong in a drill and blast tunnel. This is a photo of a wedge failure from another contract in Hong Kong. It's not in our contract. But when we're discussing about wedges and potential wedges and the support that we need for wedges, 
you can see the size of that. That's nearly the full height of the tunnel. And you can just about see the length of the rock bolts here. And the density, it's only, you know, a few of them. So you can clearly see that the bolts in all likelihood were not long enough. And they weren't enough in numbers either in density. Um, on the right hand side, this is uh, from our contract, an image of our contract from one of the, the two shafts, and you can see the amount of water we had to deal with uh, during um, construction. This is a short video to show you how much water was coming in uh, from the rock. And this is a video to show you the pressure that the water is coming out from the face when uh, drilling uh, in the face. And this is from our contract and just to see the pressure of, of the water coming out from the rock. And the last slide, uh, just to, to give you um, a timeline of, of this project. So uh, construction uh, at ground surface started in 2010. Uh, the drilling blast operation started uh, end of uh, 2011, start of 12. There was a breakthrough in 2015. And then uh, the tunnel with all the finish lines was completed in 2019 and, and has been uh, given to public since then. Right, I would like to thank you for your attention and uh, happy to take any any questions. Uh, thank you, Demos, for such an interesting webinar. Uh, the platform is open for questions. Uh, if you have any, you may go on one by one. Hi, Demos, Ayush here from TVM. Uh, I want to ask a question uh, regarding the last uh, slide which you showed uh, where the water was coming with full pressure from the uh, drilled uh, face. So how uh, how the construction team tackled that situation and they stopped the water? Yes, so, so uh, as you can see here, the um, they're just trying to, uh, there was a lot of a, a series of grouting, um, uh, injection grouting happening um, uh, during construction uh, as the blasting was uh, advancing. Uh, and, and obviously that, that's something that uh, hadn't been dealt with at the time, but then um, later on uh, in the construction sequence, uh, uh, once once all the, the fan, the grouted fan was installed, um, then that was then uh, it allowed the team to to progress with excavation. So it was it was mainly with, with uh, grout funds. With PU grouting or with cement grouting only? Demos. Sorry. Uh, with the PU grout, chem some chemical grouting or only the cement grouting? Normal. I, I think it was a normal grouting, uh, but uh, I can come back to you on that. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Demos, we have one question with from Sachin. Uh, he's asking what was the powder factor achieved? Also keeping the water in mind, which type of a commercial explosive was used? Yeah, so I, I'm not aware of all these details. That was mainly uh, like to the, the contractor to, to decide uh, on these details. Um, it wasn't part of our remit. Um, but again, uh, like I can come back to you uh, if if um, if needs be. Okay. Uh, he also has one more question. Was P wave velocity of rock taken? Yeah. So uh, when when we did our assessment, uh, we used these empirical formulas that I described in my uh, slides. Um, we also did the, like the 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 P wave, the dynamic. Uh, we had some lab tests. Uh, uh, 
um, for the stiffness. I mean, and, and we came up with with um, appropriate stiffness uh, values for the different support classes. Is it? Okay. Uh, uh, do we have more questions from anybody? I would like to uh, ask one question, Dimos. Um, the starting, uh, you mentioned that drill and blast tunnel and choosing the type of tunneling based on drill and blast or TBM uh, based on any ground condition. So like uh, how, uh, I mean, how do we choose it based on the ground conditions? Whether yes, so in this case, as I said, because the rock was quite strong, um, uh, it, it will end. It was in a, a remote place. It, it wasn't an urban environment, which it makes always difficult to to blast uh, if you're in a city due to vibrations and, and all these things. Uh, it, it's it's a much preferable uh, when you're tunneling in medium to strong rock uh, to use drill and blast because with a TBM then you have quite a high uh, tear and wear of of uh, the cutting uh, phase. And you need to stop frequently replace the heading, which is not uh, an easy uh, exercise. Um, so that's why typically in, in uh, hard rock you, you prefer the, the the drill and blast method. Okay. So uh, if we, if we don't have any, okay. So Wahid has one question. Wahid. Um, yes. Thank you for your explanation. Uh, first question is, uh, what was your uh, rock kind? Is it ignos or sedimentary? What kinds of your rocks? It was tough. Uh, so, so, so that, that's the geology, the drift and, and solid geology. Um, and the, typically uh, the rock was described as um, you know, moderately strong to extremely strong uh, with a small degree of, of um, weathering at depth. There were some some sear zones, um, but only locally. Uh, we didn't identify any, any large areas of, of um, you know, faulting or um, uh, weathering. Uh, so it, it was uh, quite good uh, ground conditions. OK, thank you. And another question, you uh, has um, you had, you know, different cross section of the tunnels. OK, in this kind of the different uh, cross section, have you calculate, um, you know, uh, my question is about the calculation in Q systems, because, you know, in a big cross section is different. Uh, sometimes, you know, you uh, excavated um, uh, in six or seven section in uh, four big cross section. But after, you know, compilation, this cross, uh, sometimes we have some convergency. And uh, my question is, uh, what is your uh, calculation about this area? Because in a small cross section is not important, maybe convergency, but in uh, big cross section is very important. Yeah, so if, if I understand the question correctly, you're talking about if you have multiple headings on the same tunnel profile. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, so we had that issue with the crossover cavern and as I showed in the construction sequence. Um, there. Uh, you know, you had multiple headings. Uh, a small pilot and then two side drifts uh, for the top heading and then the bench was also excavated in, in two in two side drifts. Uh, what we found from our assessment and what we've seen uh, from monitoring during construction was that as soon as you excavate the top heading and you support the roof, then you the, the you don't have significant additional convergence or uh, deflection lining def deflection when you come to excavate uh, the bench. At the bottom. Yes. No, uh, my question is about the calculation. You know, you uh, need different support system in uh, this kind of the uh, 
uh, cross sections, okay? But, uh, you know, my question is, uh, in small uh, cross section, support system is low. But for big cross section, you need a stronger support system. But yes, so... Please. Yes, so what we try to do is to see what are the requirements, the support requirements for the big span, for the whole span, and we try to install that even when we were excavating the smaller um, phase. So we, we would install the support that our analysis and our assessment would indicate that we need to install when you excavate the, the full uh, profile. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we have one more question from Mr. Nagaraju. Uh, I think you are in mute, uh, sir. Yes, yes. Uh, good evening. Uh, good what evening. factors have you considered for final lining? And uh, is final lining is done throughout the along the length or partly? And what is the thickness of final lining? So uh, as, as I mentioned in the presentation, we had two, two linings uh, to install. One was the temporary primary temporary lining, which uh, the purpose was just to provide the safe environment then for the tunnelers to install the permanent secondary lining. And uh, uh, the, the, the thickness of that obviously varied depending on the, the, the opening. So the thickness was different for the smaller excavations, which was a single track compared to the larger excavation that was the um, uh, the cavern, the big cavern. And also, on top of that, the yes. thickness varied depending on the rock conditions or the anticipated rock conditions. So we had the support classes, and for the better support classes, we had the thickness. And then uh, for the worse support classes, the thickness of the lining would increase. But on top of that, we may have some uh, reinforcement in, in the lining as well. So, and because it was so many profiles, the thickness is varied, you know, significantly. Um, okay, what is the grade of concrete you have used? The concrete grade? Yes. Yeah, uh, um, that's, uh, I, I can't remember now. I think it might be C40, but um, I, I can't remember. For, okay. for sure. Thank you. Okay. So I guess, uh, Dr. Demos, we have uh, covered uh, all the questions, all the queries. And if there are some other queries, you can post it uh, to us. We'll get back to you uh, through Dr. Demos. Uh, thank you, Dr. Demos. Uh, myself, Ayush Raj, Chair TOIM, uh, for giving your valuable time on this wonderful webinar. Uh, one of the most interesting webinars we have in the recent times. Uh, so thanks a lot. Uh, just for the information of all the uh, young members and all the uh, members associated with TOIM, uh, in the coming week, we are going to uh, share the newsletter and uh, one of our blogs. So stay updated, uh, we'll mail you all the details and stay updated for all the details regarding YTC. So thank you, Dr. Demos, once again. I, I would like also to thank you for the opportunity that you gave me to, to give this uh, presentation. Um, and uh, I'm happy to take any, any questions uh, later on uh, by email and I'll, I'll be happy to respond. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Demos. All these webinars will be available on our YouTube channel. Uh, you can will provide all the links uh, in our WhatsApp group, so you can have this uh, presentation. Um, uh, you can uh, view this presentation later also. Thank you, Dr. Demos. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you everyone. Much.